Do you understand the principle of Bible authority? We're continuing today our series of lessons on that topic. Stay tuned. There's a message true and glad for the sinful and the sad. Ring it out, ring it out, ring it out. It will give them courage new, it will help them to be true. Ring it out, ring it out, ring it out, ring it out. Ring out, barely ring the word. Speed it away, Lord, man. Message divine, and see. Send it today, still far from it. Jesus. Many live in sin. Welcome to the program today. I'm grateful that you've chosen to spend this time with us in a study of the Bible. And I hope that uh, you'll find our study today helpful to you. We're going to be continuing today our series of lessons on understanding Bible authority. We've spent quite a bit of time already in the previous lessons, uh, laying a lot of important groundwork and starting to look at some principles of proper biblical understanding. And we're going to continue to do that today. We looked last week at significant distinctions or at one particular distinction that we have to make if we're going to properly use God's Word. Remember 2 Timothy 2.15 speaks of our needing to handle aright the Word of Truth. In order to do that, we're going to have to uh, remember some distinctions that the Bible makes between different concepts. And We looked at one last week between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And today we're going to look at a couple of more of these distinctions that we must make if we're going to be true to God's Word. The first of those that we want to look at today is the matter of faith and opinion. If we're going to use God's Word properly, we're going to have to distinguish between those things that are matters of faith and those things that are not, those things that are simply matters of mere opinion. When we talk about things that are matters of faith, we're talking about those things that God has particularly spoken about, those things that God has revealed. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So when we talk about things that are matters of faith, we're talking about things that are matters of biblical revelation, things that God has spoken of, whether explicitly or implicitly. And we'll have something to say about uh, that in coming lessons. But if it's a matter about which God has spoken, then it's a matter of faith. Matters of opinion, on the other hand, are things that God has left to human judgment. Matters that God hasn't specifically regulated or things that God hasn't specifically revealed. And the important thing to remember is that we need to avoid extremes in this regard. Not everything that comes up in life is a matter of faith. Not everything that comes up is a matter of something that God has specifically spoken about. But other people go to the other extreme and tend to look at everything as a matter of personal opinion. Even things that God has specifically revealed in Scripture as obligations uh, on mankind, some may look at that and say, well, it's not really a matter of obligation, it's just a matter of opinion. But if we don't properly distinguish those, we can end up in the unenviable position of possibly putting something into the realm of opinion that shouldn't be there or something that's a matter of faith that shouldn't be there. So we've got to make that distinction. Now let me give you some examples of what I mean between matters of faith and matters of opinion. The Bible teaches that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. John chapter 3 verse 2. The fact that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night is a matter of faith. It's a matter that God has revealed. The Bible specifically states that Nicodemus came by night. But what the Bible doesn't say about this uh, visit from Nicodemus is the reason why he came by night. Now there may be some things that we might uh, deduce or uh, speculations that we might come up with as to why he might have came to Jesus at night as opposed to in the daytime. But those would be matters of opinion, matters that uh, we uh, would not need to try to bind on somebody else and try to uh, coerce uh, somebody else to accept that viewpoint as a matter of faith because the Bible hasn't addressed that. It's just a matter of opinion. Another example, uh, Jesus in John chapter 8, when he encountered the, uh, the woman that 
uh, was uh, supposedly caught in the act of adultery and she was brought before Jesus and uh, the people wanted him to do something about it. The Bible says in John 8 verse 6 and also again in verse 8 that Jesus uh, bent down to the ground and wrote with his finger in the ground. That's a matter of faith. The Bible reveals as much. Jesus wrote in the ground. What he wrote on the ground is a matter of opinion. The Bible doesn't say and so we can't uh, uh, formulate our own speculation about that and try to pass it off to others as a matter of biblical doctrine because the Bible simply hasn't revealed it. It's a matter of opinion. Another example, Paul suffered with a thorn in the flesh. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, mentions that specifically and Paul talked about how he had this uh, malady that, uh, that uh, he had to struggle with and that he prayed that God might remove. The fact that he had a thorn in the flesh is a matter of faith because the Bible states that he had that. Now what specifically that thorn in the flesh was is not specifically stated. Now there are other passages that might give us an indication where we could make an educated guess uh, and maybe feel reasonably sure as to what that might be, but the Bible doesn't specifically say and so it still remains in the realm of human judgment a realm of personal opinion. We also have this example that might be helpful. The Bible authorizes and specifically states that God uh, approves of vocal singing in worship to Him. Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, verse 16 are passages that are very clear that mention singing as worship to God and as something that God approves of. That's a, that's a matter of faith. The Bible specifically states that. But if in your singing to God, in your vocal uh, worship to God, you want to use a book that has the words to the songs in it and the music maybe to help you in your vocal singing, if you think that's the best way, or singing without a book, that's a matter of opinion. Uh, the Bible doesn't specifically address that or say which is the better way to go. But we do know that God has uh, authorized vocal singing. That's a matter of faith. So maybe by those examples you get the idea of what I'm talking about as it relates to matters of faith versus matters of opinion. But the question might come up to you, well, how do we determine that? Well, if we look at something in, in the Bible or some topic comes up in conversation, how do we determine whether or not it fits into the category of faith or opinion? And basically the principle is, uh, is as simple as this. You have to weigh what the Bible says or does not say about that issue. You have to study the scriptures uh, and, uh, and see what is or is not revealed about it and then reason correctly about what the scriptures actually say. And if you do that, you can put things into the category of matter of faith or matter of opinion. The important thing for us to remember in this regard is as it relates to the application of the principle, and I kind of briefly mentioned it a minute ago, but I want to really stress it here. The importance of making this distinction properly is seen in what would happen if we don't apply this principle properly. See, matters of faith are binding upon people and obligatory on people because they are matters of faith, because they are matters about which God has spoken. But if we take something that is a matter of faith, a matter of the Word of God, Romans 10, 17, and we turn it into a matter of opinion or place it into that category, then we end up in a situation where God actually requires something of us and yet we have placed it into the realm of opinion and we can take it or leave it. Let me give you a couple of examples. Repentance is a matter of faith. Jesus said, except you repent, you'll perish, Luke 13, 3. God commands all men everywhere to repent, Acts 17, verse 30. You see, repentance as an obligation is not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of personal judgment. It's not something that I or anyone else just came up with. It's a matter of faith. God has stated it. But what if I came along and said, you know what, repentance is really not that important. It's just a matter of opinion. It's just one, one man's opinion over another, and so you can really just take it or leave it. 
If I do that with repentance, then I have taken something that God has made obligatory and I've placed it into the realm of human judgment. And if somebody chooses to dispense with the command to repent, thinking that it's just a matter of opinion, they're actually dispensing with something that God wants them to do. They're not respecting the authority of God's Word. So you can't take a matter of faith and place it into the, matter of, into the realm of opinion because doing so reflects upon the authority of the Bible, and we can't do that. Baptism the same way. The Bible makes that plain. He that believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. We can't take that and put it into the realm of opinion. It's a matter of biblical doctrine. It's a matter of faith. And the opposite is true as well. We can't take matters of opinion and put them into the category of being a matter of faith because then we end up creating a law for God that God didn't really create. We then be become guilty of placing something uh, into the realm of obligation that's really not a matter of obligation. In the first century, there was an example of that. Uh, in Acts chapter 15, we read about how some of the uh, Jews that had been converted to Christ, so these were Jewish Christians, some of them were wanting to hold on to a lot of the aspects of the law of Moses that had been nailed to the cross, something we talked about last week. And they were trying to bind upon Gentile converts to Christianity certain aspects of the law of Moses, specifically circumcision. In other words, if a Gentile wanted to be saved and wanted to be uh, in the body of Christ, they not only had to uh, obey the gospel plan of salvation, repentance and baptism and all of that, they also had to submit to circumcision. Well, God hadn't, uh, hadn't required that. And Acts 15 verses 1 to 5 teaches that very plainly. Circumcision as an act in and of itself is a neutral thing. It's a matter of opinion. In Galatians 5 verse 6, Paul said, Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith that works through love. Circumcision in and of itself is a matter of opinion. It's not something that is bound upon a person by God anymore. It's a part of that old law that was nailed to the cross. Now it's just a matter of opinion. But they had taken that matter of option and placed it into the realm of faith and made it a requirement that God had not actually made. So we've got to be careful in not turning matters of faith into matters of opinion nor matters of opinion into matters of faith. And if we'll use uh, good common sense and principles of correct reasoning, we'll be able to make those distinctions and make them properly and keep them in their proper place. Now we want to turn to a second uh, matter of distinction today. Not, uh, uh, not uh, faith versus opinion, but we want to come to something else. And that is, if we're going to properly understand Bible authority, and use God's Word properly, we have to make the distinction that the Bible makes between things that are temporary and things that are permanent. In other words, there are some things that are a part of God's Word that are permanent, that God has intended to be uh, continued as a part of faithfulness to Him from the time that He initiated it until the end of time. They're permanent matters. For instance, the necessity of faith. That's a permanent. That's not something that God is one day going to take away uh, you know, as, as responsibility for people in this life. Without faith, it is impossible to be well-pleasing unto God. Hebrews 11 verse 6. God always wants us to have faith. That's a matter of permanent obligation. The need for a person to know the truth is a matter of permanent obligation. 1 Timothy 2.4 says that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. God wants us to know the truth. You shall know the truth, the truth will make you free, John 8.32. That's a matter of permanent obligation. But some things that we read about in the New Testament were not matters that God intended to be permanent parts of church life. There are some things that God intended to only be temporary, that they would be available for a brief period of time in the infancy and early stages of the growth and maturity of the church that at some point they would be done away with. They would cease to be available. They would be temporary. 
And if we don't make that distinction properly as the New Testament makes that distinction, then again we can find ourselves not being respectful of the authority of the Bible and not handling properly God's Word. And I want to give an example of a distinction between the temporary and the permanent that will take up the rest of our time today. And that has to do with miraculous gifts. Now you may be thinking, now what does he mean by that? What is he saying? I understand that that's not a popular uh, position to take today in saying that miraculous gifts were a temporary part of the church that were never intended to be permanent. And I certainly don't question at all the sincerity uh, or the motives of anyone who uh, believes that those gifts were intended to be permanent. That's not my purpose to question those motives. But this is a matter about which we must, again, consult the Scriptures and see what the Bible says. And I encourage you, don't take my word for this. Don't take my word or anybody's word for anything just because I say it or somebody else says it. Each of us has the responsibility to search the Scriptures for ourselves to see if these things be so. And I want to give you some passages to consider, to, uh, to work through, to think about, to mull over in your mind, to make them all fit together. Remember, the sum of God's Word is truth. Psalm 119, verse 160. Put these passages together. Reason correctly about them and see what conclusions are brought to bear on this issue. Let's consider the purpose of miraculous gifts, first of all. We're not left to guess about that. The purpose for miracles is given in Mark 16, 20. Jesus said that the signs would follow those that believe for the purpose of confirming the Word. In other words, miracles were, were available so that the message of a first century speaker could be validated, confirmed by their ability to perform miracles. It would confirm or validate the message. Now today, we have already the confirmed and validated message. This message that we have in Scripture has been confirmed and validated by the miracles performed in the first century that validated its message, that proved it to be true. In the first century, when somebody came up and said, you know what, I've got a message from God. And here it is, and they give some message. How was a person at that time supposed to know whether or not that message was indeed from God? Miraculous gifts. They were available for the purpose of confirming that message. If a person claimed to be speaking on behalf of God and they had miraculous abilities that could prove that God was working through them, then that proved that their message was valid. But today, if we want to validate whether or not somebody is speaking or telling us the truth, we, we validate that, we confirm it by comparing it to what the confirmed Scriptures teach. And then we determine whether or not that person is speaking the truth to us. But if you consider as well how those gifts were transferred in the first century, it will tell us a lot about whether or not they're available today. In Acts chapter 8, we learn about that. In verses 14 through 17, the gospel had gone to Samaria and many were being converted there and they wanted to pass on miraculous gifts to those new Christians in Samaria. And notice beginning in Acts 8, 14, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen on none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now if people could have and possess the miraculous gifts of the Spirit in the absence of the laying on of the apostles' hands, then why did not the Samaritans have those gifts? They had been baptized into Christ. You notice that from verse uh, number 16. They had been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, but yet... They didn't have the miraculous measure of the Spirit. Why? Well, because becoming a Christian was not the means by which one got those gifts. They had to send for Peter and John because the apostles had to lay hands on them in order for them to receive those gifts. In Romans 1 verse 11, Paul said, I long to come to you that I might impart to you some spiritual gift. Well, those Romans were already Christians. Paul was writing to them as such. They were saints in Rome. 
Romans 1, 7. Why didn't they have miraculous gifts? Because they had not yet been visited personally by an apostle who through the laying on of his hands could give those gifts to them. Is there anyone alive today that has been able to have personal contact with an apostle who could then, who by that contact could pass along those miraculous gifts? So we need to put these passages together, friends, and reason correctly about them. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 also sheds some light on this issue. In 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 and following, Paul talks about the temporary nature of these gifts. In uh, 1 Corinthians 13, beginning in verse 8, Love never fails. Whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And that word for knowledge, the idea there, miraculous knowledge. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part will vanish away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child, thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am known. Paul said that when the perfect comes, when that which is perfect, and that word perfect does not mean sinless, some have read that and said, well, that means Jesus. Jesus is the only perfect one that ever lived. And so when Jesus comes, that's when the miracles were ceased. Jesus hasn't returned yet, so we still have miracles. But that word perfect does not mean sinless. It means complete. It speaks of that which is completed, the Greek teleos. And if you'll notice, he's comparing there something that is partial versus something that is teleos, that is complete. We know and prophesy in part. See, the partial. But when the completed thing comes, then those partial things will be done away. You see, the things that are in part are miraculous knowledge, prophecy, those things that refer to the miraculous dispensing of divine information. And so he says there will come a time when there will be no more need for that miraculous gift of prophecy and tongues, the, the, the speaking in other languages of, of uh, God's message, directly inspired. So all of those things would come to an end when something that is completed comes. What else could he be talking about than the completed revelation? That which was coming in part through prophecy, tongues, revelation, miraculous knowledge, when all of that was complete, to use Paul's term, then those partial things, those miraculous gifts, would be done away. And notice his illustration. He describes and uh, illustrates this from the standpoint of childishness. When he says, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought as a child. But when I became a man, maturity, completeness, I put away childish things. He is relating the miraculous gifts to the period of infancy and childishness, if you will, of the church. Miraculous gifts were necessary in the early years of the church to get it to a point of maturity when the completed revelation was given. Some have said that miraculous gifts are evidence of spiritual maturity, that when a person is spiritually mature, then they have the ability to use these gifts and have these gifts. It's interesting because the church in Corinth had every miraculous gift that was available. They had miraculous gifts all over the place in their congregation. But if you read the book of 1 Corinthians, you see one of the most immature congregations that ever was. Miraculous gifts and maturity don't necessarily go hand in hand. Paul said... At the time in which miraculous gifts were available, we see dimly. We don't have the completed picture. But then, whenever the completed thing comes, it would be like seeing face to face. See, these things were temporary and not intended to be permanent. A friend of mine, I understand that that probably is not what you have understood. It's not what you've been taught. 
It's not what you had, uh, uh, had heard much in, uh, in your own circle of, uh, of, of friends and acquaintances and church family or others. But the responsibility that is ours is to search the Scriptures to see if these things be so, Acts 17, 11. The sum of God's Word is truth, Psalm 119, verse 160. And I'm certainly not above being taught. If you think I've missed something in this, then you can send me a letter, send me an email. We'll give you that information shortly. And if you can help me to understand the way of, more truth, uh, the way of, tr the, of truth more perfectly, then that's great. But it needs to be from the Bible. And you need to, to take these passages that we've looked at and show me from the Bible where I've missed it. But if you look at it and you see that it's true, then all of us have an obligation to accept it. Not because I said it, not because I'm something special, but because it's what the Scriptures teach. And I encourage you to study these things, to think about them. Properly make those distinctions. If we're going to handle God's Word accurately, we've got to do that. We've got to handle it making the distinctions that are necessary. We've talked about distinguishing between the Old Testament and the New. We've talked about distinguishing between faith and opinion and between things that are temporary and things that are permanent. And we'll be looking at more of these significant distinctions, the Lord willing, on our program next week. I hope that you'll tune in, tune in to that. I want to offer you a free audio cassette tape of this lesson uh, and uh, as well, if you'd like, cassettes of this entire series of lessons on understanding Bible authority. We have that on audio cassette or CD if you prefer. Just write us and let us know which one of those you like. They're absolutely free. Write us at Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. Or email us at requests at thetruthinlove.com or access our website, thetruthinlove.com. You can uh, find ways to, uh, uh, to contact us on the website. Find a lot of information there that can be helpful to you. So I hope you'll access that. And plan to be back with us again at this same time next week. Again, study your Bible more than you ever have before. Search the Scriptures to see if these things be so. And until next time, I wish you only good. Hear the blessed Savior calling the oppressed. O ye heavy laden, come to me and rest. Come no 